let's say we have vectors a equal to three comma two and b equal to two comma negative one let's draw oh oh sorry one more one more apologies and c equal to seven comma one so let's draw all of them. Okay, well, okay, I know I'm going to need a lot of X room here. So I'm going to go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, one. And then let's see. So we're going to go over three, up two. I might draw these in different colors if I had different colors available to me. So there's my vector A. And B is over two and down one. Over two, down one. Welcome, we're just drawing some vectors. And C is over seven and up one. Okay. So now what I want to do is try skip. Oh, I should I should finish labeling things. Oh, geez. Come on, James. There's my vector B. My vector C. So I want to try and show by sketching that there are vectors, sorry, there are scalars, apologies. Let's call them I don't know, S and T such that the vector C can be written as a multiple of the vector A plus a multiple of the vector B. Words you might have heard that also encompass this idea is show that C is a linear combination of vectors A and B. You might not have heard those words, it's totally fine. It just means literally you can write C is a multiple of A plus or minus some multiple of B. I'm gonna write this word here. C is a linear combination of the vectors A and B. And here's how we're going to do this graphically. We're going to, I, mean, I kind of just want to steal my picture from up there, but I guess I'll draw it again, which feels terrible. Find the same picture again is never my favorite. Mostly because I feel like my accuracy is not very good, so I feel like it never looks exactly the same. Two, four, six, seven. Three, one, two, three. So A again looks like it did before. Here's A, here's B, and here's C. Oops. So here's my best guess. Oh, okay, fine. So I think if I maybe double A, and then I mean, it's not exactly perfect, right? Those don't look exactly right. But it kind of looks like mm, maybe about approximately C might equal two times A plus one times B. Again, the idea here isn't to actually find exactly what it is. It's just to see that you could make, in fact, if I maybe did a little bit less A, to be honest, like maybe that much, and then drew my actual B on there, that was a little bit better. So that's kind of the idea here is how we can think about writing C as a combination of A and B. Let's actually find it. So we can actually solve this as well. Ah, maybe. So let's actually find the scalars. S and T such that C is equal to S times A plus T times B. I'm off the page there. All right, it's not that terrible. We're just gonna say, well, rewrite this using the actual vectors we have. C is the vector seven comma negative one. Oh, sorry, seven comma one. S is what we're looking for. 
A is the vector three comma two. T is the vector, sorry, B is the vector two negative one. You can write it this way, or honestly, I think it'd be better to write it using the I and J notation. So we could also write this as seven I plus J equals S times three I plus two J plus T times two I minus one J. And for those of you who think in Alvarado's class where there's that question about like writing the vectors in terms of like using I, J and K, it's really a very easy question. It's just looking at taking the vector and writing it as the X component is that thing times I, the Y component is that thing times J. If there's a Z component, it's that thing times K. It's really that straightforward. The idea really is that you want to be able to go back and forth between those two notations without even thinking about it. Like when I even think about this notation, I think of, of the, these are the same thing in my brain. I think of seven comma one and seven I plus J as the exact same thing. Okay, well, so now we're just solving the system of equations here. So the I's have to match up. So I have seven, the coefficient of I over here has to equal three S plus two T, right? The amount of I on the left has to equal the amount of I on the right. And similarly, one times J has to equal the amount of J on the right, which is two times S minus one times T. And now you can solve this in whichever way you prefer. My preference would probably be to isolate T here. So I'm gonna take this and rewrite it as T equal to two S minus one, and then plug that in for T over there. So that seven is equal to three S plus two times two S minus one, and then solve. So you got three S plus four S minus two, seven S over here, seven plus two is nine. S equals nine, seven. So not quite two, like I said it was gonna be. And then plug that back in over here to find T. T is gonna equal two times nine sevenths minus one, which is 18 over seven minus seven over seven, which is 11 over seven. So those would be the actual coefficients, a little, Oh, sorry, the picture, right? A little bit less of A than I thought we needed. I thought we needed a full 2A, but we didn't need quite that much. And a little bit more of B than I thought we needed. We needed 11 sevens of B instead of just one B, like I was kind of guessing. But it's okay. Yeah, and yeah, that's... That's something we, depending on your teacher for 17C, you may or may not be doing more or less of this. Some people really kind of, this quarter, the person teaching it has not really focused on this at all. So what can I say? Questions about that? Okay. Um, we've already kind of talked about that, but let's go over it again. Yeah, sure. Hey, Lala, welcome. So just as a reminder, our standard basis vectors. Used in physics and math all the time are in two dimensions, I equal to one comma zero, J equal to zero comma one. In three dimensions, I equal to one zero zero, J equal to zero one zero, and k equal to zero, zero, one. Sometimes you'll write arrows over these. I usually don't, but you might see them written with arrows over them in, to indicate their vectorness. And right, so for example, we can and should write the vector two, four, negative five as two I plus four J minus five K. It just becomes easier to deal with things. So, actually, uh, not always. I mean, it's really a matter of personal preference. Sometimes this is really useful. Sometimes it's really useful. It kind of depends on what the story is. So you should be comfortable seeing both. All right, let's get back to where we were last time, which was talking about the dot product of two vectors. So dot product 
I'm going to be very general for just a minute. So if your vectors look like this, so if your vector u had a bunch of components, like it was components were u1, u2, u3, all the way to some u sub n. So this would be a vector in n dimensions, which again, we're usually only dealing with two and three, but I just want to be broad for a moment here. I promise you we'll go back to being not so broad. Similarly, the vector v is u2, sorry, u2, oh my goodness, James, is v1, maybe? v1 is where you want to start with the first component. v2, v3, all the way to vn. So each of these vectors have n components. And the way you would calculate their dot product, u dotted with v is equal to u1 times v1 plus u2 times v2 plus u3 times v3 all the way to un times vn. And that is the nice way of calculating the dot product. The dot product, also called the scalar product. because the result is a scalar, not a vector. Alternatively, although we almost never use this formula to find the dot product, u dot v can also be thought of as the magnitude of u times the magnitude of v times cosine of the angle between the two vectors. What this gives you, which is kind of weird, is the ability to imagine and calculate the angle between two vectors in like five dimensions. She said, I have two five dimensional vectors pointing in these ways. And you could ask the, and answer the question, what is the angle between them? It might not make a lot of actual sense in your brain. It doesn't make sense in my brain, but you could, it's still something we can talk about is the angle between any two vectors, whether they're in normal two-dimensional or three-dimensional space or in some larger dimensional space. Again, we're not going to in this class really, but it's just something to be aware of that people do actually talk about finding the angle between two vectors in any dimensions you want. All right, so a few things about the dot product. Any vector, any unit vector dotted with itself is gonna be nice. If we take, for example, I dotted with I, you're just gonna get, well, it's the vector one zero dotted with the vector one zero, that's gonna be one times one plus zero times zero, which is just one. And the same is true for J dotted with J. You get zero one times zero one, which is just zero times zero plus one times one. But more interestingly, if you take any vector, oh, and I guess I, I, I was writing two dimensions here. I guess I could have gone in three dimensions. K dot K is zero, is also not surprisingly going to be one. There's a reason this is actually true. Because if you take any vector and dot it with itself, let's take a look and see what happens. So let's say we have the vector, let's go generically. Let's say our vector is V1, V2, V3. We're gonna do two different things. First, we're gonna find the magnitude of this vector. So the magnitude of any vector, again, I know it's been a little minute. It's just the square root of the sum of the squares of the components. So there's the magnitude of the vector V. It's the square root of V1 squared plus V2 squared plus V3 squared. I know, not very exciting. But now, what do we get when we take V dotted with itself? Well, when you dot a vector with another vector. Um, by the way, I should just point out, one of the reasons we're talking about this is because later on, like next week or maybe this week, when you start multiplying matrices together, when you multiply a row of a matrix by a column with another matrix, what you're really doing is you're taking the dot product of that row with that column. So often we say we dot the row with the columns and multiply them together because it's actually more correct. But here, we're just going to get V1 times V1 plus V2 times V2 plus V3 times V3. 
which is exactly equal to the magnitude of that vector squared. So oftentimes you will see the magnitude of a vector squared being replaced with the vector dot with itself, or sometimes even the magnitude of the vector being set equal to the square root of the vector dot with itself, just because it happens to be convenient. Let me ask you all a question. Are u equal to one, three, negative four, and v equal to six, two, three, perpendicular? Good question. Are those vectors perpendicular? What's another word for perpendicular? Orthogonal or what have a right angle, right? Or is the angle between them 90 degrees? Well, we're not actually gonna find the angle between them. Although we could, and we're gonna do that in a minute. What we're gonna do is we're gonna say, well, what's their dot product? U dotted with V is equal to one times six, plus three times two, plus negative four times three, which is equal to six plus six minus 12, which is equal to zero. And I will point out that we could have also calculated that the dot product was zero by saying that u dot v is equal to the magnitude of u, which I don't know and don't care to know. You know what I know it's not? I know it's not zero. The magnitude or length of a vector can only ever be zero if that vector is the weird zero vector, which where all the components are just zero. It's kind of, it's really, like it's weird to think of it as a vector because it's really just kind of like a point where you start and end at the same place. So that's not zero. The magnitude of V is also not zero. And then cosine of the angle between them. And if this whole thing is gonna equal zero, the only thing that could have actually been zero in the first place was cosine of the angle between them. So if the dot product of the two vectors is equal to zero, what that means for us is that cosine of the angle between them had to equal zero. What angle can you take cosine of and get zero? Ninety degrees. That means exactly that theta had to have been 90 degrees, which means these angle, these vectors are perpendicular. So when someone asks you, are the vectors perpendicular? The real question they're asking you is, is the dot product equal to zero? If the answer is yes, then the vectors are perpendicular. If the answer is no, then the vectors are not. End of story. So one thing we could write here is that, sorry, not aware. U and V are perpendicular to each other, or if you prefer orthogonal, I like I like saying orthogonal just as well. If and only if the dot product of U and V is equal to zero. Um, well, there was something I saw. I feel like I saw someone write in their lecture notes. I don't remember what teacher it was. U dot V was equal to like zero with a with an arrow above it, but it shouldn't have been because the dot product doesn't equal a vector. It should equal a scalar. Not a huge deal. I think I think it was actually something more like this. They were so they were doing like zero dotted with a vector, which would be like the vector zero zero dotted with the vector v one v two. And that would be zero V1 plus zero V2, which is the scalar zero, not the vector zero. So I want to be clear with everybody, the zero vector is something like the vector with all zeros in it. So it could be the vector in two dimensions or the vector in three dimensions, or really in any number of dimensions, but whatever. On the other hand, 
the scalar zero is just the number zero. Just good old zero. No bells and whistles. So a more fun question might be, what is the angle between u equal to 5i plus 2j and v equal to 3i plus 4j? Okay, here's a, so there's a formula you can't memorize. I don't feel like it's really worthwhile. I would just work with the two dot product formula. So here's where I would start. I would say that I know that u dot v is equal to five times three plus two times four, which is five times three is 15 plus eight, which is 23. Ooh, 23 is a great number. Fun fact about 23, not important at all. Two times three plus two to the third plus three to the second is 23. It's kind of my favorite fact about numbers ever. Like it's just fun. I know, I know, but I'm gonna write down anyway. two times three plus two to the third plus three to the second equals 23. I mean, come on, can't beat that. It's pretty great. Bring that one home to Thanksgiving. So tell someone, tell tell one of your family members to Thanksgiving. Hey, by the way, this. And be like, wow. If you really want to blow someone's mind, ask them which is bigger, e to the pi or pi to the e. Anyway, moving on. So then u dot v is equal to that. But we also know that u dot v, which we just found to be 23, is equal to the magnitude of u times the magnitude of v times cosine of the angle between them. But we can find the magnitude of u and the magnitude of v. Right? The magnitude of u is the square root of 5 squared plus 2 squared. The magnitude of v is the square root of 3 squared plus 4 squared. And cosine of theta is still there. So that's going to be, let's see, 5 squared is 25 plus 2 squared is 29. So the square is 29. 3 squared plus 4 squared is 25. The square is 25 is 5. So I've got 5 root 29 times cosine theta. And these two things, those are equal to each other. Those are both ways of calculating u dot v. That's going to allow me to solve for the angle theta. Now, I will warn you, the solution is not going to be pretty. I don't remember. Is anyone doing web work? Yeah, no one's doing web work, right? You know, Lee's definitely not doing web work. Goldstein, over. Yeah, no one's doing web work. How atypical. Almost usually at least one of the professors is doing web work. Okay, cool. So then... I would set these two equal to each other and say five root 29 times cosine theta is equal to 23. And then we're gonna get cosine theta equal to 23 over five root 29. If, well, no, we'll get there. This is not a number you were expected to know, right? You should not know what angle gives you cosine of that angle equal to 23 over five root 29. We should just say that our answer is theta equal to the arc cosine, or if you prefer the inverse cosine, of 23 over five times root 29. And uh, nope. if you pull out a calculator, do be careful. Sometimes people ask for answers in different units. So if I find, can you see that? You kind of see that? I can, I can kind of see that, okay. So let's see here, if I was gonna find this, so I would start with this. I would do 23 divided by five times root 29. Great, it's 0.85. And then I would find the inverse cosine of that. Whoops, this is, I forgot to do, ah, oh, geez. I forgot to put in the answer there. There we go. It's about 0.54. Hmm, about 0.54. Degrees or radians? So think about it this way. If it was degrees, that would literally mean it was half a degree. 
that is really, really close to zero degrees. And cosine of zero is one. And cosine of half a degree should be very, very, very close to one. Not 0.85, which is what I just took the English lesson. I know it's not on the calculator anymore. Um, so I'm pretty sure I'm in radians, but we can also check. If you go to your, wow, it's been so long. Yep, I'm in radians. If I change it to degrees, which I kind of prefer, I think, for these kind of problems, and I find the same thing again because I deleted it because I'm smart. So there's our value. And then if we take the inverse cosine of that now in and you hit answer like a smart person, James, you get about 31 degrees, which makes sense because we know that cosine of 30 degrees is equal to one half. So cosine of 31.3 degrees is approximately, no, wait, that's, no, I'm sorry, I'm getting things backwards. Cosine of 30 degrees is about root, is root three over two. Sorry, sorry, sorry. And root three over two is about 0.86. So inverse cosine of about 0.85 is pretty close to 30 degrees. That makes sense. Usually, though, if you have to do something like this, your answer is going to be just the arc cosine, or if you prefer, the inverse cosine of this terrible quantity over here. Okay. Maggie, you look like you have a question. No, okay. Just scratch your head. All right. Um, yeah. Questions about that. Let's look at another example. Let me give you a nicer example. Eh, maybe nicer, we'll see. So let's find the dot product and magnitudes of the following vectors. vectors. A equal to, no, it's not going to be nice. I'm just going to make stuff up. 2, negative 1, 0. And B equal to 1, 5, negative 3. So I want you all to find the dot product and find each of the magnitudes. Sorry. Finish part to A, B, and C, D part B.
let's go ahead and find the things because there's still a couple more things to get to here. So a dot b, again, dot product should be a really kind of straightforward calculation. It's going to be two times one plus negative one times five. Plus I probably wouldn't even write zero times negative three. That's going to be two minus five, which is negative three. There's your dot product. Dot product can be positive or negative. I'll point out if the dot product is positive, it means the angle between the two vectors is acute. If the dot product is negative, it means the angle between the two vectors had to be bigger than 90 degrees so that the angle is essentially in quadrant two. So the cosine of that angle is negative. So if the dot product is negative, it kind of means the vectors are pointing in somewhat opposite directions as opposed to more in the same direction. Um, the magnitude of A, square root of two squared plus negative one squared plus zero squared is the square root of five. Mag my, my fives never look good. Square magnitude of B is the square root of one squared plus five squared plus negative three squared which is, let's see, one plus 25 plus nine to the square root of 35. And now we're gonna find the angle. So honestly, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take my two dot product equations, set them equal to each other. So I'm really just thinking of setting u dot v, which I know is equal to negative three, equal to the magnitude of u times the magnitude of v times cosine of theta. And I know everything except for cosine of theta. I know that u dot v is negative three. The magnitude of u is the square root of five. The magnitude of v is the square root of 35, which I could probably simplify in some way, but I don't really care. And then I'm gonna isolate cosine of theta by dividing by the square root of five times, you could probably simplify that. Five times 30 is 150, five times five is 25. So if you really wanted to, you could write this as, negative three divided by the square root of 175 is what that's equal to, is cosine theta. So then cosine, sorry, then theta is going to equal the inverse cosine of negative three over the square root of 175. which I don't know what that is. I could use, you could use a calculator to find it. It doesn't really tell you a whole lot more other than how to use the calculator to find it. But I'm 100% sure that angle is gonna be between 90 and 180 degrees because it's the inverse cosine of something negative. I would say most of the time when people ask questions about this kind of thing, instead of asking you to find the angle, they actually ask you to find what cosine of the angle is. So a better test question would be find cosine of theta where theta is the angle between these two vectors. Oh, cosine is equal to negative three over 175. And that would be the end of the place there. Let's talk about planes for a second. Let's talk about finding the equation of a plane if we know a couple things about it. So let's find the equation of the plane whose normal vector, meaning perpendicular vector. Oh yeah, there's another word for perpendicular. You got perpendicular, you got orthogonal, orthogonal, and you got normal. Those all three kind of mean the same thing, perpendicular. Whose normal vector is lowercase n equal to three, one, negative two. Lowercase n is the typical notation for a normal vector and contains the point um, 2, negative 5, 1. Once you know how to do this, it is not that hard at all, but it's the knowing how. So here's, where, here's how it's going to work. There's my plane. Let's call it P. No, let's not call it P. Let's just leave it alone. And let's say here's my point. 2, negative 5, comma 1. And here's my normal vector sticking out of it perpendicular to the plane. Our, so this is, well, I'll say that in a second. Our job is to describe every point in the plane, right? If you're trying to find the equation of the plane, you want to find an equation that describes any point in the plane. So I'm going to pick any old point. Let's say it's over here. 
There's the point x comma y comma z. I'm going to draw the vector from the point we know is in the plane to this other point that we're trying to describe. Let's call that vector v. And what do we know about the vectors n and the vectors v? Are they perpendicular to each other? They have to be. If that vector v is between two points that are in the plane, then the vector v is stuck in the plane. And the normal vector to the plane is normal to any vector that is in the plane. So any vector that's in the plane is perpendicular to this vector v. You know what that means for us? It means that the dot product of n with v has to equal what? If the vectors are perpendicular. Sorry, what was that? You're not wrong. You are very right. But in this special case, we're, oh, in fact, let me finish what you were saying. The magnitude of the vector times what? Yeah. Cosine of the angle, right? What's the angle between these two vectors? What's cosine of 90 degrees? Right. So when two vectors are perpendicular, we know that their dot product gets to be zero without having to do all the calculation. But it's good. That it's still very much important to know what the formula is. Okay, great. So the vector n was given to us. The vector v I have to work a little bit here for. V is, you always take the end points minus the beginning points. So the vector V is X minus two comma Y minus minus five. Let's write Y plus five and Z minus one. So there's my vector V and my vector N is three, one, two. And let's take their dot product. So N dot V equal to zero is going to give me three comma one comma negative two dotted with X minus two comma y plus five, comma z minus one, equal to zero. Well, let's take the dot product, right? The dot product, just like every other time, you're just multiplying the corresponding components together. So we're gonna do three times x minus two, plus one times y plus five, plus negative two times z minus one. And technically you could leave the equation like this. I would prefer to multiply it out. So I distribute these coefficients. I'm gonna get three X minus six plus Y plus five minus two Z plus two equal to zero. Negative six plus five is negative one. Negative one plus two is positive one. And if I subtract one from both sides, I'm gonna get three X plus Y minus two Z equal to negative one. All right, it's negative one. Let's double check by plugging two, negative five, one, three times two plus negative five minus two times one is six minus five minus two, which is one minus two, which is negative one. Yeah, that checks out. Observe. The coefficients of x, y, and z, coefficients of x, y, and z are the components of the normal vector. And that is not a coincidence. That is always going to happen. Let me show you another way of doing this, which is a little bit less um, computational work. So here's what you can kind of jump to, if you prefer. Instead of saying, well, I know I'm gonna do like this whole thing, I'm gonna do n dotted with this vector I'm gonna find equals zero. Let's see what's in the chat here. Why is the vector, oh, good question. So we kind of talked about this last class where if you wanna find the vector between two points, it's going to be the points at the end minus the points at the beginning. So I'm doing X minus two, Y minus minus five, Z minus one. Just like if I want to find the vector between say like the points, A equal to three, four, negative one, and B equal to two, zero, eight. I would find the vector AB by doing the components in the B part minus the components in the A part. So two minus three, zero minus four, and eight minus minus one. That vector would be the vector negative one, negative four, 
positive nine. If I wanted to find the vector going in the other direction, meaning starting at B and ending at A, I would subtract in the other order, which would really just change all the signs. I would get three minus two, four minus zero, negative one minus eight, which would exactly be the opposite vector of this, one, four, negative nine. So that's how we're finding the vector. We're just saying, oh yeah, it's gonna be the things here minus the things here, x minus two, y minus minus five, z minus one. Welcome, yeah, of course. So then what I wanted to point out was instead of doing all this work where you find that vector, dot it with a normal vector, set it equal to zero, and maybe simplify it down to this, down to this, you can instead say, well, look, let me write the thing again so I have the same equation. So right, our normal vector was three, one, negative two. And the plane contains in the rain in Spain, no. the point two, five, one. Right, it contains two, negative five, one. And so you can do this. You can say, well, great. I know my equation of my plane has these coefficients. 3 times x plus 1 times y minus 2 times z equal to some constant. And then I can just plug in the point. Plug in 2, negative 5, 1. And you're going to get 3 times 2 plus 1 times negative 5 minus 2 times 1 equal to that constant that we're trying to find over there. 6 minus 5 minus 2. Uh, one minus two is negative one. So we end up getting the same exact equation, the three X plus Y minus two Z equals negative one. And this is generally considered to be the easier way to do this, but you don't have to do it this way. If you like the other way we did it, that's totally fine. Or if you're asked to kind of show the work, right? It, does, it is more explicitly showing what's happening by doing what we did the first time and drawing the picture and doing the dot product. But the end result is going to be the same either way. If you're ever unsure if your equation of your plane is correct, the two things you need to look for is are your coefficients the, the, co the, the components of the normal vector? Yes, they are. And if you plug in your point, does it work? If you plug in x equal to two, y equal to negative five, and z equal to one, is this a true equation? Oh yeah, it is. That's all we have to check. Okay. Time. Mm, not that much time. Let's do one more thing and then we will call it a day. Let's talk about how you project one vector onto another. Which I feel like the notation for is never good. Let's do it anyway. So let's say we have, we'll draw two pictures projections. So when I think of it, I think of something like this. Here's my vector V, here's my vector U, and I'm projecting U onto V. We're going to project, before I draw a picture here, we're going to project U on to V by dropping a perpendicular from U to V. I'm just going to write the symbol for perpendicular instead of spelling it. So we're just going to drop this perpendicular down right there. And this vector that I'm drawing right here, it starts there and ends there. That vector is the projection of U onto V, which we call, here's the notation for it, the projection of U onto V. The V is the little subscript. The U is in the, like the normal line. The usual, I shouldn't say normal, I should say the usual line. Um, so when you look at this, to remember what's what, U is kind of above V. So you're projecting U onto V because U is above V. And you could do it like that. You could also have something like this where maybe V is going that way and U is going that way. And so to project U onto V, you have to drop a perpendicular onto V extended in its line. So there's your projection of U onto V. Oh, 
Oh, it's time to do that. Oh, we have enough time. Okay. I'm gonna draw some angles in there as well. So here's how I think about finding the projection. I'm always looking to think about using cosine because I know that if I think about cosine of my angle, eventually I can do enough work to make it so that the dot product shows up. So if you're trying to figure out a formula or think about a formula, think oh, I need I need cosine in there somehow. So we look at this tri this triangle, cosine of theta is equal to the adjacent over the hypotenuse. So here the adjacent is the length of that projection. So the magnitude of the projection of u onto v divided by the length of the hypotenuse, which is the magnitude of u. Um, and sometimes people will say, I don't love this notation, but people do call the magnitude of the projection, they call it the component of u onto v. So the magnitude of the projection of u onto v is called the component of u onto v. Not my favorite, but it is a thing people write. So I, I just don't want to not say it and then have to be like, say that we have the component. I'm like, what's that? Can you guys see what, do you have a question about what I'm writing here? Okay. Oops, now it's, it's totally wacky. All right, all right. So how do I make this look like a dot product? Well, I know for a dot product, like the dot product of u times the u dot v, I need the magnitude of u times the magnitude of v times cosine of the angle between them. So all I'm going to do, this is a very common technique, is like ask yourself what do you want and then make it happen by multiplying or dividing or doing whatever you need to get what you want. So I'm just going to multiply both sides by the magnitude of u times the magnitude of v. Feels kind of like cheating, but it's not. So magnitude of u times magnitude of v times cosine of theta equals the magnitude of the projection. I still can't write it that way. It's just not me. Of u onto v divided by the magnitude of u times the magnitude of u times the magnitude of v. Welcome. And then these end up canceling out. This ends up being u dot v. So we end up getting that u dotted with v is equal to the projection, the magnitude of the projection of u dotted with v times the magnitude of v. And finally, maybe not finally, but if we solve for this, we end up getting that u dotted with v divided by the magnitude of v is equal to the magnitude of the projection of u onto v. I never in my life remember this formula. Whenever someone asks me, James, how do you tell this? I'm like, well, let me derive it again really quick because it just doesn't stick in my brain. It might stick in yours though. That's not true. It probably stuck in my brain when I was taking linear algebra for a quarter. I was like, oh yeah, I need to memorize this formula, but like it hasn't stuck since. So there's the magnitude. Now when we talk about a vector, if I want to find the actual projection, I'll remind you all that a vector, uh, it's time. It's, I'll remind you all that it's three o'clock and I should stop talking. I'm going to say one more thing. I'll remind you all that a vector is a magnitude and a direction. The magnitude of this vector is u dot v divided by the magnitude of v. The direction of this vector, what vector is this vector also pointing in the direction of? v. So if I want to find the projection, and let's just write it up here, so I need to use a new piece of paper. The projection of u onto v is equal to the magnitude u dot v divided by the magnitude of v times the direction. But the direction is just the direction of v, but as a unit vector. So there's your magnitude. There's your direction. And then, sorry, sorry. Let me say one more thing. People often simplify this as u dot v over v dot v all times the vector v. Right, because the top is u dot v, magnitude of v times magnitude of v is v dot v, and then the vector v stays up there. And I would do an example, but it's 301, so I shouldn't. 